Hello, family. Welcome to African Esquire TV. I'm your host, Tunis Cherie. It's really my goal that four years from now, our people will no longer be willing to play certain political games that we've been willing to play really since we've been allowed to vote inside of this country. And of course, the political games that I'm talking about are the games that you have to vote for a certain party or you have to vote a certain way without actually having a political agenda and having a candidate promise to actually meet that agenda. So hopefully four years from now, we will not be in the same position as we have been for over 100 years at this point. Now, I want to talk about what the Black bourgeoisie, the Black political leaders who have been appointed to be our overseers, have been doing in light of the fact that they did not have a Black agenda prior to telling all African people you have to vote for Joe Biden. So I'm going to read from an article, a very quick excerpt. Um, it says, seven civil rights groups want a meeting with Joe Biden the agenda, they say, is appointing black officials in top roles, not lower ranking ones. OK, so representatives from seven of the country's leading civil rights organizations and the article doesn't say which organizations, but we can all kind of guess which organizations are probably the ones in the meeting. It's probably the NAACP, probably the Urban League, probably a representative from the Congressional Black Caucus, probably people who are in that circle who are meeting with Joe Biden. So they're meeting with President-elect Joe Biden in the coming, day, coming days, and they're escalating pressure on him to appoint a Black nominee to the remaining high-profile cabinet posts amid concerns that white nominees have dominated so far. Biden has rolled out a diverse set of appointments, but reserved the initial marquee spots for the, in the cabinet and in the White House for white candidates, prompting worry that Biden is failing to make good on his promises to promote black leaders to prominent jobs. So what does this mean for us? Well, number one, it should be emphasized that the black political bourgeoisie did not have a, a political agenda that they were pushing for Africans in America. Despite the fact that we are the most abused people in America, despite the fact that we're the most oppressed, the most poor, the most incarcerated, the most miseducated, the worst in every single way, they still did not feel like we were deserving enough to have a specific agenda that was going to undo the, uh, the vestiges of slavery inside of America. Well, obviously this is something that's always existed because these people are not from us, these people are from the white establishment. And whenever you come through the white establishment and that is where you gain your position of prominence, your loyalty is never to the people. Your loyalty is always to the machine that is going to pay you, that's going to uphold you, and that is going to ensure that you have a long and, and luxurious career inside of these Washington politics. So it's not surprising. But the thing that should be emphasized is that they're saying that they're going because they want to push a black agenda. Well, they didn't have a black agenda, so OK. Okay, what are you going to push? Well, they're going to push putting African people inside of prestigious positions inside of the White House administration. That is their agenda. Now, why is that something that should be an absolute insult to every single African in this country? Because that agenda is nothing when it comes to changing our conditions, changing the environments that we live in, changing the fact that our people are dying at alarming rates from the coronavirus. Putting a black face in the position of prominence is not going to do anything to undo what has happened to us thus far. And the biggest evidence of this is obviously there was a black man who was ele uh, elected to the presidential president of the United States for eight years. And that did not change anything of, of the conditions that we live in. So the question must be how either how dumb are you or how dumb do you think we are to think that you're actually doing something for us by pushing these types of things. Africans have already occupied so many of these offices. We've had Africans be the president, obviously, uh, secretary of state more than once. We had African Supreme Court justices. That did not African change anything about our condition because it did not change the system from which those people were operating in. If the system is created and fomented to oppress us, that is the, the systemic um, legacy of it from down to the bone. You, you, it doesn't matter who you put inside of that position. It doesn't matter how black they are, how black they talk. It, it doesn't even matter if they're well-meaning. You could actually have someone put inside of a position who actually may really want to do something for African people, really want to change our conditions. But the fact is the system was not created to warrant that. And anytime a system is threatened, 
understand anytime that a system is threatened from any person who's an actor, whether inside or outside, the system will pull out all punches in order to reinforce itself. Things like demonizing the person or ostracizing the person, digging up old allegations about that person. Anytime that someone poses a threat to the system, the system will handle them accordingly. So obviously putting black people inside of these offices, you're not putting them in the office to be black people. You're putting them in an office to be white, basically, to be people who are going to reinforce white supremacy and not challenge it. So the fact that they felt like they could actually muster up support for making this the first thing that you do for African people, despite the fact that right now we're dying from the coronavirus more than any other people, despite the fact that among the, uh, along with the coronavirus, since uh, people have been laid off, since people have lost their jobs, we've been the most affected. Over 40% of our people are the people who are recently put into poverty because of the coronavirus. Despite all of that, the first thing you wanna do is something that has already proved to be inept, to something that's not going to address our problems. That's what you want to do first for African people. Now, this article was on December 1st. So since then, obviously, um, maybe they had their meeting with Biden or whatever. A lot of people in our community are getting a little anxious because they are not seeing enough of the progress they thought they would have seen at this point. Let's not disappoint them. And let's not get to a place where voters in Georgia begin to second guess. Okay, let me respond. I, I, I've got I to go. Let me respond. There's a lot to respond to here. Let's get something straight. You shouldn't be disappointed. What I've done so far is more than anybody else has done this far. Okay, number one. Number two, I mean what I say when I say it. I mean what I say when I say it. I'm the only person who's ever run on three platforms that I was told could not possibly win the election, and I never ceased from it. One was on restoring the soul of this country because of what I saw happen in Charlottesville. That was it. No one else was talking about it. The words of presidents matter. Nobody else, no progressive, was talking about it. I did. So I'm reading from another article. Um, it says, keeping his promises, Black presidential appointments in the Biden administration. As the Trump's campaign's legal challenges sputter to a near halt, presidential observers are eager to turn to the season's parlor game of choice. Speculation over who will get the big jobs. In the next administration, typical prospects include high dollar donors, senior campaign advisors, and those who had a long and personal or professional history with, president -elect, with the president-elect. But during his acceptance speech in Philadelphia, President-elect Joe Biden acknowledged the groundswell of support from Black voters throughout the election process when he stated, especially for the, those moments when this campaign was at its lowest, the African-American community stood up for me. They have always had my back. And he said, I will have yours. Taken by itself, this statement can either suggest that the incoming administration will heavily focus on the policy issues affecting Black Americans, uh, i.e. the pandemic, joblessness, the police brutality issue, or appoint Black leaders to senior level positions at agencies or a combination of both. So this is what is essentially a Black agenda. Either you do one or the other, or you try to do both. You either focus on what actually changes our condition, the policies that are affecting us, or you put black faces inside of positions of white supremacy, or you try to do both. Um, early cabinet selections and the composition of Biden's transition team suggests that achieving racial and gender diversity is indeed a goal. Not since President Clinton has such attention been given to diversity in presidential appointments. Seven uh, cabinet positions were filled by black leaders during the two terms of the Clinton and Gore presidency. The Biden administration has been equally um, diverse and has had its legacy extend beyond cabinet positions. So here's what they're comparing it to. Not since President Clinton. President Clinton, the same President Clinton who passed uh, th three major legislations that I'll point out, and that's not all, but three ones that completely changed the trajectory of the African community in America. One, obviously, the crime bill. Two, the welfare reform bill. So let's even like put these in context. So you had a, a, a welfare reform bill that says 
okay, you cannot stay on welfare no matter your circumstances. No matter if you are a poor mother with children, you cannot stay on welfare for uh, this amount of time. And no matter what your circumstances are, we're going to cut you off. Okay. Now, simultaneously, while you had a lot of Africans getting cut off of welfare, then you had an incarceration bill. Okay, so I can't pay for anything. I can't survive inside of this current economy. Well, now the prison system is willing to take me, willing to take me if I try to find other ways in order to support my family. And we know that inside of African communities where there is essentially a, a lack of any type of economic opportunity outside of a legal activity, that it's only a matter of time that if you're starving, you're probably going to engage in something that warrants drug, um, uh, some type of drug dealing, right? So then on top of that, what you have is a, a third a third law that was passed in the, in the Bill, Bill Clinton administration, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, that said, um, if you cannot provide for your children after the welfare bill, we're going to put your children in a foster care and we're going to have them adopted. And then there was other laws that were passed that were essentially uh, promoting transracial adoption. So they were trying to push African children out of the African community. So what is this saying that you are going to say, well, not since the Bill Clinton's administration, probably the worst administration in recent years for African people. What is it saying that to say that this was the last time that we actually had this many presidential appointments that were African? It's saying that essentially we're being put into a position to be duped yet again, to be duped by someone who can play the saxophone, duped by someone who can who can talk like us and who can hang with us. We're being duped once again into being inside of a subservient position and possibly getting some of the worst type of legislation unleashed on us yet again. So. Um, Now, obviously, this is a Pan-Africanist channel, so let's talk about the Pan-Africanist um, side of this. So one of the recent appointments that just came out was that Joe Biden is, had picked um, General Lloyd Austin to run the Pentagon. The Pentagon, obviously, which is the center of U.S. military operations, these are the operations like the ones that are going on in Africa, AFRICOM. These are the ones that have targeted a lot of leaders, a lot of revolutionaries who were not doing things that were even a threat, if you ask me, to America even American capitalism, but they were doing things that had a threat in the long run that is inspiring other neighboring countries or other regions to also adopt policies that were an attack on global white supremacy. So this um, same Pentagon is going to be led for the first time by an African, a man that by the name is Lloyd Austin. President-elect Joe Biden has selected retired general Lloyd Austin to serve as Secretary of Defense, according to three people. Um, in picking him, Joe Biden has chosen a barrier-breaking former four-star officer who was the first Black general to command an Army division in combat and the first to oversee an entire theater of operations. Austin's announcement comes as soon as Tuesday morning. Um, Austin, who also ran the U.S. Central Command before retiring in 2016, immersed as a top star candidate in recent days. After being viewed for a long shot for the job, okay, so it was he was a long shot for the job. It wasn't even someone that was in the periphery, peripheral of a lot of people as far as someone who's going to occupy this position. But good old black leadership, they got right in there and they pushed for some black faces to be inside of positions of power. And the most ironic thing is perhaps the position that would have the worst effect on um, African liberation, whenever you look at it as a, glo a global movement, is the someone that's going to be occupying a position that's actually African. Very so probably the most telling thing about this is that this decision was backed by the Congressional Black Caucus. It says General Austin is a Southerner with has impeccable credentials given his military career and would be an outstanding secretary for the department, said Representative Beanie Thompson, a con Congressional Black Caucus member who is close to Biden. Um, so here we are, once again, the Black Caucus is standing with or against African people, trying to make a distinction as if having an African face on inside of a pr prominent office is some type of move forward, whereas having an African face inside of an office that has been known to target African liberation, as if that's not compromising. But once again, we have to ask the question, where are we drawing the line? Are we actually saying that we're for freedom, or that we're for liberation, or are we essentially saying that we back, uh, that we back global white supremacy, that we back the position our people have been in, and that we don't want any revolutionary change that's going to move us forward? That's where the 
Congressional Black Caucus has really consistently stood. They've stood on the side that we would rather have uh, feel good about ourselves. We'd rather have people that look like us inside of positions, even if those positions are hurtful to our people. So what does this say to us um, right now as we're looking for uh, looking towards a uh, four years of Joe Biden. And of course, after that, there will be another election where these same um, pleas will be made to Africans to vote for an oppressive system. Well, this means that we have to more now than ever pay attention to what is going on and actually have these analytical conversations about what we think African liberation looks like. Because if African liberation to you is just having a black face instead of a position to do more harm to your community than good, then clearly your concept is fermented in counter-revolutionary logic. So well, those we are really my thoughts on this whole subject. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts and I will see you all in the next video.